And they can see and hear you too. All right, Josh, take it away with the introduction. Great, welcome to the Geospatial Forum today. Um, today, it's my great pleasure to welcome my friend and one of the leading remote sensing scientists in the world right now, Dr. Jeju, um, to present at our Geospatial Forum. Um, Dr. Zhu is an assistant professor in the Department of Natural Resources and the Environment at the University of Connecticut, and there he's the PI uh, and founding uh, leader of the Global Environmental Remote Sensing Lab, uh, as well as many other hats that he wears. Uh, Dr. Zhu is also a member of the Landsat Science Team, uh, an author on the fifth National Climate Assessment Report, and associate editor for leading remote sensing publications, including Remote Sensing and Environment, as well as an editorial board member on many others. Few scientists impact their field to the degree that Dr. Zhu has, and those that do spend the majority of their career working towards that. Um, by comparison, Dr. Zhu is a fairly early career scientist, but has published two of the most important remote sensing papers of the last 20 years as part of his dissertation. <laughs> he recognized that the only uh, that the recently available massive archives of image time series would revolutionize the way that we map and monitor Earth's surface, but not before we solve some major challenges first. So to that end, Dr. Zhu um, rendered these masses of archives usable by inventing FMASK, which is an innovative and highly accurate method to automatically identify clouds and their shadows in time series of imagery. Um, it's now an important part of the operational processing chain for Landsat imagery. So if you've ever used Landsat imagery, you have used FMASK. Um, next, Dr. Zhu developed CCDC, the Continuous Class, uh, Change Detection Classification algorithm uh, that works on time series of, of images. Um, it has revolutionized the field and is now the benchmark standard for modern change detection approaches. Um, I could go on uh, listing citation counts, awards, and seminal papers, but I don't want to embarrass Dr. Zhu, who is above all else a wonderfully kind and decent human being. So I'll just conclude by saying that Dr. Zhu is undoubtedly one of the most impactful remote sensing scientists of the past several decades. And it's a great pleasure to host him here today. Today, he'll talk about his most recent work that takes a multifaceted view to the process of land change on Earth. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Zheju. Thanks, Josh. Thanks that for the nice word. So today I'm going to give a talk on this remote sensing of land change, but on a multifaceted view perspective. And this is a paper that currently in review. And I'm also going to talk about another uh, pro product we just created like one week ago. It's about corners wide land disturbance and also its agent, the driver of the disturbance of all land pixels, corners wide. So before that, let's go to next slides. Uh, I want to using this paper as one introduction of this talk as the entire topic about land change actually started, I think, from this milestone paper from Dr. Turner on this emergence of land uh, change signs for global environmental change and sustainability. And this is the first time the land change is treated as a major science domain. And uh, after that, you can see a lot of research studies has been going on after this. And one of the main paper that I like most is this paper in this uh, land change science um, paper by in Turner, Dr. Turner. And this paper actually, you can see the land change actually involve a lot of things. There is a human subsystem, there is a biophysical subsystem and the land cover, land use are the one that linking the two. And remote sensing basically are the ones, you can see the arrows here, the observing and monitoring, that's where the remote sensing are taking its role to provide detailed information for a much larger area. However, one thing I want to know that this paper is great, but it's mostly looking at more in the modeled side, like the human environmental system and also the modeling of land cover, land use. Uh, it's not a, it's not a mostly focusing on the remote sensing perspective. So what we do is we trying to looking at land change, but in a much more remote sensing uh, domain to see how this uh, should be evaluated and quantitatively studied. And before that, I want to show some terms and which are widely used in a lot of remote sensing land change papers. 
for example, that term of land surface change, land disturbance. And a lot of you have probably see land cover use change, right? Or sometimes land cover modification conversion or vegetation succession, climate change, climate variability, biophysical change or biochemical parameter change or spectral change. And with so many different terms, it's easily to get confused. As the editor of remote sensing of the environment, there are a lot of paper using those terms interchangeably, but they actually mean quite differently. So in order to better know, better define land change in remote sensing, a more uh, systematic defined framework is needed. And the reason why there are so many terms and they are quite confusing Thing is just because land change is basically a multifaceted issue. So basically what we have is images, different spectral bands and different uh, time. We can call this a data queue. And by different, different time, the image were collected at different bands, we're able to have this spectral change, the value of spectral reflectance differences from day one to day two, right? And where you basically using this information and project it into different kinds of phase, phases of land to know, to learn or infer or quantify its land change information. For example, we can know the land, land, the change location, the change time, the change process, the change agent or the change target. And those domains are not always the same spatially. For example, you can have a change happen showing up in the change location, but they may not showing up in the change target because based on how you define your target, it may be a change, maybe not. Um, so this is the first time we put all those different kinds of phases of land change in the remote sensing perspective in one figure. And we want to put this hierarchical system to making sure each kind of change aspect R has its own location. And you can see most of the time we're using the spectral change. That's where we have in remote sensing to get the when, basically the change time and the where, the change location. And we can also infer what. So what has been changed? We call this change target. And most of the time we're trying to do this land cover change. And sometimes we're using land cover to as a proxy for land use to infer what's land use. And we sometimes call this land cover land use change, right? And in, the, in this category, there's a land cover conversion and also land cover modification in which, in which modification don't necessarily change in the cover type, but they change the condition of the cover. And the second one of the target change is more broad, like biophysical, biochemical uh, parameter change. It can be changes in LAI, tree height, biomass, leaf moisture, leaf chlorophyll content. And in another aspect, for example, the why, to answer the why, uh, we can identify the change agent. And it can be from climate. And for example, climate change, climate variability, or from uh, land disturbance, and that's the, um, one of the major driver. For example, there are anthropogenic disturbance and natural disturbance. And in the natural disturbance, there's a biotic and a biotic disturbance type. And vegetation succession can also be a major change agent for uh, land change, uh, but mostly they are getting the surface greener than uh, brown, browner. And for the how, basically, we are trying to ans uh, answer the question how this change is actually happen or the change process. And we can define based on the magnitude of the change, for example, if it's a subtle change or, or a dramatic change, or the duration of the change, right? It's an abrupt change or it's a gradual change. Next slide. And this is the figure which for the first time we're trying to get the relationship of the, the terms I just showed before um, in a one figure. Basically spectral change include everything. And as 
if there's a spectral change, definitely something happened there. However, if there is spectral change, it does not necessarily mean there is a real change occurred. For example, the sensor can have malfunction and there can be atmosphere influences. There can be, be none uh, and there can be a cloud or all those kind of things can showing up as spectral change, but without have any kind of land surface change occurred there. And for within the land surface change, uh, usually that's, um, you can see this uh, smaller one, you can see there's a biophysical or biochemical parameter change. That's usually something, the parameter on physical or chemical is different. And uh, this can be something like a repeated each year, for example, phenology change, right? You can have LAI changing throughout the year, but uh, this, is, this is just a natural uh, repeated the cycle of the vegetation, right? So within this circle, this red uh, ones, we actually call the land cover change. And we sometimes, it's also called the land surface change. Basically something really happened on the surface. It's not repeated. And the driver, you can see the land disturbance, clim climate variability, climate change, or in the succession are all within here. And sometimes it can causing its land cover modification, right? So majority of time, actually, they don't change the cover, they change the condition. And sometimes if it's uh, um, strong enough, you get this land cover co conversion, changing cover type, which is on the right. So um, basically that's how all those terms looks like if you put them all in a figure. And there are also issues in remote sensing. If you want to uh, detecting change, you have to use in the right band that basically separates um, the change from the non-change places. And this shows uh, the first column is 2019 image, the second column is 2020 image, and this uh, different rows are different the spectral bands from visible, near infrared, short infrared, thermal, all the way to microwave. And you can see, and this actually is a, there's a big fire happened on the mountain for the forest. And you can see that the right is the absolute differences between the two uh, year for the same spectral bands. You can see that if you're using visible bands or the C band microwave, you basically are not able to see anything. There may be some very weak signal. However, if you're using near infrared or infrared and thermal, you're able to clearly capture this fire band area. And the short wave infrared seems like one of the best band to detect. So, so you have to have the right band, spectral bands. Uh, another remote sensing issue is the spatial issue. And we showed up there, there is actually two image. When the first column is collected in 2018, the second one is 2014, at different resolutions from MODIS, Landsat's planning scope, uh, 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 NAP data. And the resolution is from 500 meter all the way to 0.6 meter. And the right column is basically if you're using the NAP data as a reference to put the fraction of the, tr the vegetation change into 30 meter by 30 meter basically land, land, land set scale, how it looks like. And if we show up this change location map, you can see um, for the modis, you, you likely you have no change because um, the fraction of the change is way smaller than its capability to to de define detecting the change. And usually the change is defined something like a 10% of pixel change. And for here, there's much less than 10%, right? And, but at Landsat scale, you can start to see the change location pretty well. And the planning scope, you can see much more detailed. And in the NAP data, you see much more detailed. And it, different resolution, you actually get slightly different maps, right? And the lower row is the change target. And uh, if, if you take a look at um, the change target map actually are not the same as the change location. It's mostly the differences, how you define what's a forest cover, what's a urban cover. For example, uh, forest usually define as more than 90%, more than 10% of tree, right? So even you have a tree remote, Removal from 100% to 20%, you still get a class of forest. So 
uh, it's not the same if you're looking at the different aspect of this change. Uh, another thing uh, I want to mention is remote sensing issue on the temporal domain is basically we even we're using lots of data. For example, we're using all the available Landsat data uh, as long as it's not cloud, 100% cloud covered. Uh, some of the change you're still not able to capture if you don't have an image right on the spot, for example, flooding. And in this case, we just have one image cover this flooded area in uh, March 16th, 2019. And uh, if you don't have an image connected at this time, or if there's a cloud cover this area, we're not able to see this flooding anymore. And uh, uh, in figure A, that's where the flooding occurred. And this is the observation of the shadow infrared band for uh, this location, the center of this red rectangle. You can see it's much lower than the other time, but it's getting back one image later. And for this figure B, basically this is reflectance of short wave infrared band one. And this is observation for the uh, for this same location. You can see it's actually getting greener. So this is actually from the climate variability. You get a, a much more raining. You, you, you get greening in the vegetation, uh, very ephemeral greening. And you see the signal showing up here. However, if you are, you, your data is, less dense if you get one image per year, you may not able to see this big jump, a uh, big reduce in the short wave infrared band one. That means there's much more vegetation going on there. Another case is uh, figure C, we're showing the uh, beetle infestation for this location. You can see that um, the red rectangle show where this impacted area is lasted for more than a few years. And later on, it started getting back to greening again. But so basically, we have to have enough observation within this duration of the change, able to. That's the only way we can see the change. And the last case, D, is basically a forest converted to residential area. You can see mm, this. This is basically any time if you collect one image, you are able to see that. But that's because this duration of the change, as soon as it's happening, it will be there forever for most of much, much longer time if it's converted to urban. And another temporal is, uh, issue on the temporal domain is uh, sometimes there are some kind of very ephemeral change. And uh, you can see that um, when you are using Landsat data that collected at two path rows. And for example, we have Landsat pass and here, and not the lens that passes here, there's some overlap area. And this image, uh, the figure C shows the past 12, uh, and the, on the right is past 13, They're actually the two adjacent paths. And in the overlap area, we, we're having a temporary uh, frequency just enough to capture this gypsy moss infestation, which you can see in figure B on the left is, is using two, uh, pass on the overlap, we're able to see that, right? But if you're just using a single pass, most of the gypsy mouse infestation are not able to capture that. And the figure A actually showed uh, the, two, look, uh, the two example pixel plot for using a single pass. The blue dots are from uh, pass 12 and using the two pass. Uh, the green dots are from the pass 13. You can see that the two pass are able to capture this change uh, by using when the density is increased, is doubled, right? So it seems like it's always, it's, it's great to have denser time series, um, but it's not always the case. For example, if you get the overlap area of Landsat image, in the overlap area, one image you're looking at this angle, one image you're looking at this angle. So there is a bi-directional uh, effect in the view, view zenith angle, which is able to causing large deviation between image collected from the two paths. For example, the green is still from, uh, is from past 42, the blue dots from 41. You can see that if you're using two paths of the image, you get denser time series. You also get much larger fluctuation of your time series. In that case, uh, there's a large uh, change happen um, in this red rectangle, uh, which you can see that clearly easily identified uh, if you're using a single pass. 
blue color. But if you're using two paths, you're not able to see that. And there are some current land change products. Uh, we evaluate some of the widely used product and look at uh, the different phases of the product in terms of change location, change time, change target and change process and change agent. And what we found is that most of the covers are actually only looking, most of the product are only looking at the first two or three uh, phases of land change. And the majority of them are not able to go through all the phases of the, to look at land change. For example, land process, you can see only LC map and uh, global, for, uh, global surface water includes and the change agent of almost only like one of them is providing and only provide one change agent to fire so um the lc map is probably one of the product that provide majority of the agent at the same time cover a lot different kinds of land cover land use uh, except for this land agent they don't have a product right now and this is one of the uh, examples showing a small area of the 10 product from the LC map suite. You can see that's pretty good. Um, and um, there are a lot of information involved there. So uh, that's the basic idea uh, of introducing this multifaceted view of land change. And now I'm going to introduce an algorithm called the continuous monitoring of land disturbance. Uh, which is an algorithm built based on an algorithm called the continuous uh, classification change section. Um, but the target is not looking at land cover, land use change, it's mostly looking at land disturbance. And you can see how this algorithm works. Basically, you get enough observation, we get a new observation, we get a time series model and predict future observations. And then if there's a change occurred, we identify that and feed a new mod, uh, model again to continue doing this kind of change. And land, land disturbance here is defined as any discrete events that occurs outside of the range of natural variability of land surface. And on the earth, there are lots of land disturbance that are happening very frequently with different kind of agents. But I want to say that majority of the land disturbance won't causing a land cover land use change. They cause condition change and making the modifications in the land cover land use. And uh, we analyzed 40 terabytes of data using lens ARD lo uh, locally uh, at uh, HPC. Basically any images with cloud cover less than 100% we're going to use. So for, you can see for, and on the right, it, basically the legend shows how many lens analysis ready data I use for each grid. Sometimes we have more than 4,000 images for those location. And this is how the continuous uh, corners wide land disturbance detection product looks like. And so this product basically show all the breaks identified in the model for every pixel at 30 meter resolution, starting from 1985 all the way to 2020. And you can see that a lot of disturbance occur there and I want to emphasize again, a lot of them won't change the land cover land use type. And uh, it's harder to see the frequency of the uh, land disturbance at this, just this is the most recent map. So the, 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 the recent disturbance will cover the previous disturbance and the color is showing the time of the disturbance. So we made a map showing um, uh, aggregated to one kilometer but the, the, it's a three-dimensional map, right? The height of the pixel basically shows the number of change occurred through the past uh, 35 years. And you can see that California is a very busy state with a lot of disturbance and Northeast part of the US is much stable than um, the other places in the central, US that the disturbance mostly causing both by the climate variability and as well as the agriculture practice. So it's good to know um, the disturbance, but it's also very important to know the driver of the disturbance. 
all right? Whether it's caused by harvest, mechanical, insect, uh, hydrology, debris, and the fire, all those kind of driver are super important and super interesting to, to know. And we put these two levels of the uh, disturbance agent uh, classification system. Basically, anthropogenic has harvest and mechanical. Sorry, and natural disturbance has insect, uh, hydrology, and debris, and the fire can be both, right? It can be uh, anthropogenic uh, and natural, so we put fire into another category. And this is basically the, our study area. We pick basically uh, five sites, cover places that are of a lot of interested disturbance. And uh, you can see this is the algorithm we proposed. We call the object-based disturbance agents classification approach, or DACA. I'm not going to go to great details on this algorithm as we have another uh, preprint here. You can, if you're interested, look at the paper. Uh, basically, we're trying to use an object-based approach, but we're taking the all the available open source data as our training data, and automatically extract those open source data, and and using the code that detected disturbance object to identify um, the agent of each uh, disturbance object, and this basically where how we created the open source data. Uh, for getting our uh, training data. So you can see a lot of them are directly extracted from the open source data. So we don't need to do anything. Only a, one agent, the debris needs some visual interpretation because uh, um, the debris are basically mostly from landslides or weather like tornadoes and hurricanes. But it's possible there's a landslide or hurricanes nearby, but sometimes it can be the, the change, the disturbance object extracted from those locations may also cause from other agents. So we want to double making sure uh, those ones are from this uh, debris categories. But for all the others, they're 100% fully automated. And the input data, basically we are using, so we, we, we detecting the change already using time series, right? The, the animation I showed before. So we're using, if the change occurred, we have information on the pre-change. For example, the time series model coefficient, the room square arrow of the time series coefficient, and also the post-change, right? Why the change into? that time series model coefficient, RMSE from that model fit, and also the during change. For example, this image shows this location before, during and after change, and all those information are very helpful for us to uh, classify the, the, the change agent. And this is basically the um, table shows how many different kinds of uh, input features we have. It's a total of 175. So there's a lot of them. There's during change, pre-change, post-change. We're also including topography and the patch. Patch basically provide, we treat each change as an object. And basically there's a lot of information you can extract as this object in addition to the per pixel information, right? And another thing is that we, we, we know that local training is always better than global training. However, uh, sometimes we, if, what if we don't have enough training data for this local location? So we try to combine local training with global training to see the combination, what's the optimum percentage of using local training versus global training. And uh, this is overall accuracy and this is percent of local training samples in a, a, a versus uh, the, the rest will be global. Uh, training data, basically the corners wide uh, training data. And you can see that 60% from the local training, 40% from the corners wide training uh, show the best results. And this from cross validation results. And we also test how many number of training samples are needed. And it seems like when it goes to more than 5,000, it's already pretty stable. And it goes to uh, 10,000 to making sure it's, uh, uh, it's not going to change too much. Um, so that's basically the, how we track training data. And let's take a look at how this maps looks like for uh, different test sites. I just showed the five test sites, right? And uh, for the sites A is New England area. And it, this 
this figure L1, 2, 3, 4 are taken from this New England area, L1, L2, L3, and L4. And it's, uh, it's, it's, this figure contains a lot of information. So let me explain uh, that uh, the first row basically are the change, the disturbance identified and classified. The different colors basically provide, uh, provide you the information, the driver of the, or the agent of the change, whether it's harvest, mechanical, stress, debris, hydrology, fire, or other. Other means sometimes uh, it's climate variability or um, uh, tree regrowth breaks. So most of the breaks we're not interested. And the color from the, the lighter to darker means it's the, the time this change is identified. Right. So you can see, for example, for the, this green color for the harvest, you can see those are the earlier year of harvest, those darker green are the later years of harvest. And here are the reference image, the high resolution image from Google Earth for the corresponding location. And you can see uh, how the landscape of this surface. And clearly we can capture the harvest pretty well. And, and the mechanical in the urban area, the new road, new houses uh, are being built. You can see that. And I want to mention that it does not necessarily to be new, right? You can have a re, uh, re, re redo the surface of the highway. You, you, you add the new asphalt. It's going to show you up as mechanical change. Even it's the same land cover. And that's the same cases for the uh, those buildings. And for this one, it's actually a tornado. It's correctly classified as debris as it's going to causing a lot of debris after the tornado. And for this one, uh, it's showing up mostly the L4 here. It's in Rhode Island, there's gypsy moss infestation. I want to say that um, there are actually omissions arrow in this map because uh, we are in this application, we're using a single pass and row. So we're not using overlap area. If you're using overlap area more, we'll be detected. And this is another site in Southeast part of the US. You can see it's way busier, right? There's a lot of forest management going on. You can see most of the areas green color and uh, the debris from L2 actually is, uh, is there is a big hurricane uh, go over this place. And the debris here, here is actually a tornado. And L4 here is, uh, you can see their, their agriculture practice and also water related hydrology change. And Great Plains, I can see a lot of the red color, actually the mechanicals from the agricultural practice. And there are some fires you can see from L2. And mechanicals in L3, those are from urban de development. Hydrologists from L4, this location. And this is Rocky Mountain. And uh, you can see here, there is actually a mix of fire as well as the stress because the, there's a constantly a lot of beetle infestation. And after beetle, there's a um, harvest or fire to remove the dead trees. Um, so, and there's also harvest and there's a mechanical. And this is far west. And uh, you can see in the middle here, there's a large areas agriculture is correctly classified mechanical. And also here is, uh, we know, all know that west is pretty dry and there are lots of fire happening. You can see this yellow color are showing up almost everywhere here. And they're really large patches. And hydrology here, L3, and also other kind of change in L4, mostly in, uh, those in semi arid places driven by the climate variability. And we also did an accuracy assessment for the five test sites, and uh, over accuracy is pretty high. Uh, that's mostly because a lot of the places are not the change. So, large area actually are either other or uh, not change. And uh, the producers and the users accuracy, which is showing up here for uh, harvest, mechanical is pretty good, but the stress is relatively low. It's only 60%. And debris, the user's accuracy is low. So there's a lot of commission, but omission is 
uh, small. It's a hundred percent. And the hydrology one is high. Fire is relatively high. Other is pretty high. So this is the accuracy assessment only for the five sites we have. Uh, what we did, we just did is we using this method and the run for the entire corner swipe and created 30 meter, 40 and 36 years of land disturbance agent map for the first time. Uh, it hasn't been validated yet. And we already see places that are not very accurate. We're trying to improve it, but um, I'm going to show up here. So what you see now is a land cover map, which we have already got used to. But later on, what I'm going to show is a land disturbance agent map. So for the same land cover, they can be harvest, mechanical, stress, debris, hydrology, fire, others, right? The agent can happen on any kind of land surface. So that's the map we just created by using lots of cores and uh, classify uh, 175 features uh, fully automated using our open source data. Uh, so conclusion. So land change basically is a multifaceted problem. In order to better define and study it, we have to notice this, uh, its nature. And second, some of the change phases, such as agent process, are way less studied and need much more focus. And remote sensing has many limitations, for example, in the spectral, spatial, temporal, and angular domain uh, in imaging this multifaceted land change. So we have to consider all those limitations and acknowledge we are not able to do everything. There's, there's something we can do, there's something we can't. And finally, the first high resolution, 30 meter resolution, conus wide, land disturbance and disturbance agent product has been created for years between 1985 and 2020. It hasn't been validated yet, but so far, overall, it looks good. Yeah, that's all. Uh, oh, sorry. Lastly, uh, I want to say that it's a group work. It's, uh, I'm, I'm just one who present the work, but the, those are the brilliant mind behind it that make it into this nice slice. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you so much. Um, everybody has politely muted themselves so you can't hear what is surely deafening applause. Thank you so much. I think we have time for questions. Um, so if you don't mind just unmuting yourself and asking a question or putting it in the chat, if you prefer. I'll get the ball rolling while people are typing in their question or mustering up the courage to, to unmute. Um, the change agent is really interesting aspect. And one thing that's always occurred to me is that we don't make very good use of all the data available. We, as remote sensing scientists, we try to tie our hands behind our back and say we have to solve the problem solely with imagery, but we have things like hurricane tracks and things like that too, right? So instead of maybe trying to remote to machine learn whether this was a forest loss due to a tornado, could we not use like tornado tracks and things like that too? I wonder if you have any ideas about that. Yeah, that's actually something we have considered to using that as a input data for training. It. Um, it definitely would Im greatly improve the accuracy. However, um, one thing is that that track is a vector, right? So basically it, we are trying to do a raster map. So to match the two is one issue. Another thing is that you have to, our map actually are able to create near real time product. So you get an image, you get a product. And for the track, um, you have to automatically extract those tornado location, those hurricane location uh, by the different resources we have. And that's uh, causing challenges. So, so far we're just using the Landsat data and the topography data alone. We're not using outside data as input, but we're definitely using them as a training data source to extract data. Yeah. Uh, so someone requested if you could toggle back to the slide with the change agent map. You mean the global, uh, the corners wide or? 
Um, in specific, I, yeah, maybe that. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Dija asked, um, what well, says that you have beautiful visualizations and asked how long it took to complete the project. I assume there are many projects, but maybe that she's talking about the visualizations themselves. I don't know. Uh, to, to get this results actually take us more than a month to firstly run the code algorithm and uh, classify. So the classification actually is that not that computational expensive, but the running the code algorithm to detecting the breaks in the time series is, is the one we're taking like a month. So we're using like a 1000 course running for one month in parallel. So that's a lot of computation for sure. It is. Uh, Dr. Morella Tilberry asks, uh, what data do you use for accuracy assessment for the agent of disturbance map? So for the agent disturbance map uh, validation, we are using all the resources we have, including the Google Earth image. We're using the Landsat uh, data, image chips, time series. We are using all the, I showed up this kind of the resources we have, basically the ancillary data we, uh, we can collect it as a reference. And also we are taking a look at high resolution from planet scopes if it's recent. So anything, and we also, for example, we, we sometimes see a location uh, with a big fire. We look at that location, we search on the internet to verify if there's a report on the location, the same year, same months, that day, the similar day that, that, that there is a big fire happened. And usually you can actually get news. And also that's also the case for tornado. You actually can align the tornado tracks along with the uh, disturbance. And if it happened this almost a similar day, it, it's gonna to be labeled correct. While we're waiting for more questions, maybe I'll take the chance to ask somebody on the Landsat science team to tell us a little bit about Landsat Next. Landsat Next is going to be a completely different sensor. Uh, and there, it's likely to be a higher resolution, likely to be more spectral bands. And, um, and we are actively uh, working on, I think the recommendation from the science team has already given. And um, we should hear more. And, and there is actually, um, I think there is actually a white paper, maybe if you search on the Lancet Next on the USGS website. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Tilbury had a follow up question. Um, if you were to apply your algorithm globally, what sort of challenges do you expect? Training data. <laughs> So if you take a look at all those kind of local training from the open source data, um, almost everything is from the US. Like the National Insect Disease Survey Database, you don't have that outside of anywhere out of, outside of the US. Uh, mechanical, right? We're using land cover trends. That's a USGS data set only have available in the US. Um, the land fire is a US product. So almost everything and MTBS, the fire data is US based. So um, if we go outside, I assume they're gonna be a large or huge effort to collect those training data everywhere. Consider for each location, we're using 10,000 pixels, right? And there are like 4,000 image grid in, if we want to map globally. 4,000 five by 5,000 pixel grid. So it's it's going to be massive work. But computationally, algorithm uh, methodology based, I think that won't be an issue. It's just as long as we have large computer, we have the training data, we can make it work. So do you plan to apply these globally at some point or, or not yet? Uh, maybe we firstly get the US done, we get accuracy rights. Yeah, global is always our next step. Sounds good, thank you. You're welcome.
We have a question um, from somebody in the conference room. Does the does your global environmental remote sensing lab utilize any GPU computations or most of the parallelization occurring across CPUs? So we actually have a cluster of our own with three GPUs in the HPC. And uh, so far for the code algorithm, mostly it's parallel in computing cores. Uh, but there are other research, for example, we're actually using a UNET approach for classifying um, the human related change because and also we are having work on the solar panel we're using unit and they're all using the computing from the gpu yeah. but this works entirely from the cpu yeah. great thank you uh, we have a question from paul um would it be possible in a time series analysis to classify at the same time land disturbance due to climate climate conditions like hydrology and harvest or should we always analyze those individually? There, that's a very good question. Um, it's, they happen simultaneously a lot of, a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we actually can have a product provide you with like a primary driver, a secondary driver based on the random forest votes. And that actually can provide extra information if there are multiple uh, agent contributing to the change. And actually there, even for the uh, definition, there's some confusing definitions when we are looking at, at our maps. For example, for some agricultural practice, uh, some water ri uh, rice, you, you actually get irrigation. You actually get flooded in the surface due to the irrigation. Um, so we classify it into hydrology. Spectrally, it's, it's similar, right? You get a water flooded uh, grass, but it's actually mechanical, right? It's human irrigation. So there is some, even for the definition, sometimes they're not, they're like separable, separable from one to, from another, right? That both hydrological change and also it's mechanical change. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'll ask a question since we're waiting. What, what's the quickest that we can detect change on, on the surface? What are the factors that control that lag time? And, um, and it, it matters, right? Because it affects the types of things we can do with it. If you don't know if something was deforested until three weeks after, you can't use that monitor for enforcement. But if it were in two days, maybe you could. So maybe you could speak to that. Yeah, so right now what you see here is we're just using Landsat 4, 5, 7, 8. We haven't used 9 yet. But, but uh, f at this frequency is updated. We are able to update it every eight days, but we haven't done that yet. So the algorithm is able to do this continuously. However, uh, in order to make that running continuously, that's actually need actual work. For example, we need to store those intermediate parameters in the computer memory in order to make it continuously running. So, so far we just run from start to the end to get the results. But if you make it into this continuous mode, it's, it's sometimes about eight a day we're able to update. And another thing you want to consider is also the cloud. If there's clouds, which is 50% of the time, so normally we don't able to, we're not able to see for the same location in like a half a month. Uh, to update our results. However, one thing I want to mention is that there's Sentinel-2 data available, and uh, we have already tested to incorporate Lens and Sentinel-2 into this code algorithm. And uh, by doing that, we're able to update in every about two to three days globally for, every, for any location you want to detect. And even you consider cloud cover 50%, you're able to have one clear observation um, in a week. So we have the capability to go all the way to the weekly update. What about the potential for, for radar? You showed some of the Sentinel-1 results. They look pretty, I mean, that was a, a fairly good example, I guess, based on what we've seen. Is there any hope for this stuff? It's just so noisy. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we try to include in Sentinel-1 data in our analysis. It turns out it's doing more harm than good. Um, so, Maybe the method should bring actual information from Sentinel-1, but putting them together in a data set to detecting change, um, it's going to 
causing omission commission on two sides, right? The, sometimes there is a change detectable in Landsat, but the radar data is not. So you're causing this omission. Sometimes it's not a change, but there's large noise in the data. It actually showing up as change. So it's going to cause some trouble on both sides, I think. There's another question. What are the most important predictors or variables you found when trying to classify the change agents? Most of the time is this during change information. So we call this change vector. So it's the model predict value versus uh, the observed value when the change actually occurred. Uh, and, and also the land cover, uh, the land time series model before and after the change that also are very important parameters, the coefficient of the models. When you tune these models, you have to have a balance between precision and recall, um, type one, type two, however you want to think about the errors. Do you detect, you know, do you, do you stand the risk of missing some change sites to be sure of the ones you map, or do you go the other direction? What is the, how did you think about that when you're deploying an algorithm at scale like this? Yeah, so we, we actually tested the code algorithm using a, a total of 7,000 uh, random samples for the conus wide. And we tested threshold and how many consecutive days to confirm a change to balancing the two. And the result is about 30% omission commission uh, conus wide for all land disturbance. Just seek to balance those things. Yeah. Um, one more question from the conference room. Uh, what's your opinion about using fused images, for example, something out of Star FM, to detect changes rather than using Landsat alone? Yeah, that's a great idea. I think that's going to to greatly intensify intensify uh, the time series and able to detecting change sooner. However, I want to emphasize another thing is that with the Landsat. 7, 8, 9, and Sino 2A, 2B, and in the future 2C available, that's, that's not that important anymore, right? You, you don't need to do any fusion. You have data that are uh, two days, three days available at the original resolution. And even consider the planning scope data, we have the daily uh, five days observation. So there's high potential um, we, we, we can just use in the original observed data at high resolution at much higher temporal frequency than fusing data. We, we, we're losing the need for data fusing in the future. We're data rich. Yeah, if we could just figure out where the clouds are in Sentinel-2 imagery, we'd be good to go. We'd use those. <laughs> can, I, can, can I ask a follow-up question on this? Sure. So, you uh, you talk about the um, similar two and two two A and two B, um, like using those to combine with Landsat time series. But what if you want to like go back in time and um, detect changes happened before? Would that Star FM or E Star FM those algorithms to be like useful? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's true. Um, Star FM could definitely help after 2000 for places where, for example, I'm involved with this global land cover mapping at Boston University. We found that there are quite some places, even after 2000, you don't get like two, you don't get an image in two or three years, sometimes five years for some locations. And in that case, uh, StyFM could definitely help uh, to improve those locations for time series analysis. Oh, thanks. Um, on a slightly uh, different um, note, uh, purely spatial approaches we haven't been able to do due to computational reasons, but as that has improved exponentially over the past decade or so, uh, we're kind of encroaching on the territory where we can start to incorporate the information across the time domain of neighboring regions and pixels. Um, I, I wanted to know what, what your thoughts were regarding that. Um, I'm kind of exploiting that, that spatial domain better across time. A great question. Uh, it's my, I've been trying to 
including this temporal spatial all together for a long, long time, I would say. And for sure, the spatial thing, um, it's not necessarily we need more computer computing. Actually, sometimes if you want to, you, you analyze at object level, you are able to save a lot of the computing computing in, in reality, sometimes is the other side. Um, the two way you can do the spatial and temporal thing. One way you can do this object, you can do, you can identify the object first, and then you identify um, this change at the object level. And I have seen actually there's a software called the PCI. They they have we're, um, we're working with them. Um, we, we established a center here to working together on this object based approach, basically identify object and see the changes at the object. So the time series basically object time series, and turns out that much faster you can you can compute like a one lens an image with a single laptop in a few hours. That's way way faster. Another way you can do is you can do at the time series level and then aggregate results at this, at object level and get new change detection results. Uh, and this is more time consuming, but we have a paper in preparation uh, has shown improved the results about like a 8% increase in F1 score, F2 score um, in overall for land disturbance. And it's also much more appealing if you're looking at the object-based, um, we call it obby code. Um, they're able to see the patches changing. And this is way better for places such as agriculture or forest that usually they happen in large patches instead of individual pixels. It removes those uh, salt and pepper artifact in your change map. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, I think we're coming up on time unless there's time maybe could, somebody could squeeze in one more question. Can I ask just one, one more question? Um, so as you may know, we have a large group of PhD students in geospatial analytics in the audience. So I'm wondering, given that you've been doing a lot of influential work, uh, what are some emerging topics in your opinion that are worth tackling? Wow, there, there are a lot of um, things I think we can do in the future. Just for land change, I think, um, for example, I created something we call the land general land disturbance algorithm, but it's what we found right now is that it's really hard to detecting all kinds of disturbance or change in the, on the land surface. For example, if you're using this approach for places like coastal tidal wetland, you're going to see the accuracy is not that good. So for each kinds of different ecosystem, there is a new, uh, more better or adapted method can work usually better than this kind of more general approach. And that's one thing I think it worth study. And also my, my lab is also trying to, so we have done a lot of change studies, right? But um, right now, what are the impact? What are the implement, implications of those change? So I always feel like um, the need of, so in remote sensing, I think we are move, shifting from this mapping to monitoring, right? And now that we're sh shifting again to the near real-time monitoring and th there's still a long way to go. If the people are interested in that part, I think that's an interesting domain. But for, that's just for the monitoring mapping part. I think moving more into this, okay, we know this when, why, where, why, how it changes, but Moving next to this assessment of its impact, I think that's a um, very interesting part that remote sensing can help because um, we just know where they are, what they are, it's not enough, right? The, the same fire happened on the wet, on the same like a drought happened on the wetland, on the barren land, they're totally different, right? The impact of this change, I think is very important uh, issue and also, if even further, we can try to think of design method for the adaptation, right? We have this impact, how we adapt to it or mitigate uh, this kind of change. I think all those are very exciting 
topic that remote sensing can help. And our lab is right now in, in this shifting from this, uh, from the monitoring mapping to this um, evaluation and uh, uh, policy adaptation part. I, I think that's uh, one very interesting uh, future research direction. Yeah. That was great, thank you. Okay. All right, thank you. I think that's officially the end of our time. Um, if we could thank uh, Dr. Zhu again for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. We appreciate you, your time. Um, John, parting words? Uh, I was just applauding, sorry. Oh, no, I meant John Bogle, if he's still here. Um, usually announces something about happy hours or, or something like that, but um, perhaps there's nothing to announce. Okay, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, uh, Jay. I'll see you soon. Yeah, soon in DC. Bye bye. Have a good day. Bye.